think we'll give a couple minutes. Well, I think we'll uh, go ahead and uh, get started today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us, our first Friday uh, seminar um, in uh, October. Well, it's already October. Um, and I'm just going to introduce, I'm Rob Murphy. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Global Health. And I'm gonna introduce our uh, director of this Center for uh, Global Cardiovascular Disease, Mark Huffman, who will be introducing our speaker today. So Mark. Thanks a lot, Rob. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Huffman. I am the director, as Rob had said, and thanks a lot for joining us uh, for our latest installment of the Institute for Global Health's First Friday Seminar Series, uh, Transforming Hypertension Care in Nigeria Through Strengthening Primary Healthcare Systems. Uh, if you've not already, please check us out online and join as a member at globalhealth.northwestern.edu backslash members. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, and today, you know, just thrilled and delighted to have with us Dr. DK Oji, a uh, longtime collaborator and friend who's going to be presenting on his work on implementation research studies related to the effectiveness and implementation of multi-level system interventions for hypertension control at primary care centers. Uh, DK uh, had his medical education at the University of Baden and also trained in internal medicine and cardiology uh, at University College Hospital and at Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital in Australia. He got his PhD in cardiovascular medicine from the University of Cape Town. He is decorated across many professional organizations, including the West African College of Physicians, the American College of Physicians, the European Society of Cardiology, and the Nigerian Cardiac Society. Um, it's just been a real pleasure to be working with DK over the past several years, many of us um, in the Center for Global Cardiovascular Health. So we are so excited to hear him speak and present some of the work that we've been doing. Um, at the end, uh, you will be able to put some uh, questions in the chat uh, directly to the questions uh, sort of the person, uh, which is at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So DK, please take it away and we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, for your very kind words. And uh, I want to very much appreciate uh, Rob of Murphy for the kind invitation and also extend that to the family of uh, Institute of uh, Global Health of, in, uh, of uh, Northwestern University. So I will go ahead and share my slides um, with, yeah, so Christian, so I could share my slide. Um, I think that's my slide, so. So just like uh, Mark mentioned, we, we've been working together now for about four years. And much of our work has been on uh, looking for strategies to reduce the burden of high blood pressure in Nigeria. So what I'm going to be discussing about today, we want to 
look at how we can strengthen the primary healthcare system, uh, in which we have been working in in about uh, about what, over a year now. We've been working in 60 primary healthcare centers in the federal capital territory of Nigeria. So my talk will actually revolve around that. I have no disclosure to make. Um, so my outline will be, I would look at the burden of hypertension in Nigeria, uh, then go on to look at barriers to management and some solutions, especially as preferred by the Hypertension Task Force of Pan-African Society of Cardiology. Then I will look at the update on our hypertension treatment in Nigeria study. And I link this up to some studies, uh, other studies, especially individual studies that our team members have proposed to carry out. Then again, I look at our newest um, um, successful application that is a Nigerian sodium study, um, which will be funded by NIH, UG3, UH3. Then I'll just mention in a slide some other international collaboration before I conclude. Um, just to remind us that Africa has 53 countries, and these 53 countries are spread into five regions of Northern Africa, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Central Africa, and also Western Africa. Actually, Nigeria sits in the West Coast you know, of Africa, and that is Nigeria there. Um, Nigeria, naturally, is divided into two parts by two rivers. Um, called River Niger and River Benue. And they meet at a confluence here called Lokoja. You don't need to remember that, but that is a confluence city um, called Lokoja. So naturally, we have two regions, northern part of Nigeria and southern part. In fact, until 1914, they were two different countries. Um, and um, it was only in 1914, the then British government join the two countries together to become one entity, Nigeria, in what is called an amalgamation. Nigeria has um, um, a, a landmass of about 960 kilometers square. And I'm sure we know that is the largest black population on, on earth with about 200 uh, million people and also the 10th largest population all over the world. So like um, other parts of the world, hypertension is a big problem in Nigeria. This review by one of my friends, David Sadeloye, in 2015, paints the picture to an extent. And you can see that the prevalence from about 27 community studies which he reviewed puts the prevalence of hypertension at about 29%, being higher in men compared to women. And it is said that in 2030, the prevalence of hypertension will be rising to about 31%. Unfortunately, awareness um, is quite low and treatment also and control, as you can see also from this review by another colleague of mine. Worst still, hypertension, by the time a lot of patients are coming to us in a clinic with high blood pressure, they have one complication or the other. Either they have hypertensive heart failure, they have some form of renal impairment or cerebrovascular accident. And by the time they have an EKG done or echocardiography done, they have some form of left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, this is data from our Abuja heart study which was a prospective registry, which we carried out between 2008, uh, 2006, sorry, to, uh, to 2018. And in this study for, of over 1,500 patients we studied, we found out that about 30% of them, by the time they were presenting with us, had one feature or the other of hypertensive heart failure. So hypertension actually first cardiovascular disease in Nigeria. When you compare with the Western population like the USA and in Europe, remember that what drives heart failure is coronary artery disease. This is not the case in Nigeria and in some part of Sub-Saharan Africa whereby hypertension purely drives um, heart failure. So for this subgroup of patients, we tend to say they have hypertensive cardiomyopathy because by the time they are coming to us, they have reduced contractility or, or left ventricular ejection fraction. And if you go ahead to do maybe a CT coronary angiography for them or 
and semi-invasive coronary angiography, you'll be surprised that a lot of them, that coronaries are just very, very clean. So, problem of hypertension is big all over the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and control treatment is quite poor. And these are some of the reasons why it is so. There is poor access to medications, high cost of medications, and so patients have to pay out of pocket because insurance coverage is very low. For example, in Nigeria, insurance covers just less than 10% of the population, and most times it's for people working with the government. The private sector is not much covered, except if your company is quite interested. So insurance coverage is quite low, and people have to pay out of pocket. There's wait long waiting times at health system, and this also interests me very well. Inadequate number of physicians, it might interest you that in Nigeria, the physician-patient ratio is about four to 10,000. And I also paint the picture of the primary health care we are working in. in. In the Federal Capital Territory, we have about 243 primary health care. And it will interest you that the number of doctors that have to cover those primary health care are just 17. And out of these 17, six are involved in administrative work, 90% of the time and just have 10% of the time for clinical duties. Other barriers that have been uh, documented, uh, documented in this review is limited capacity for adequate diagnosing and prescribing, poor tracing of non attending patients, then poor provision of care for health providers. Now the task force for hypertension of Pan-African Society of Cardiology, knowing the body of you know, high blood pressure, the poor control, poor treatment, and the sequelae associated with it came out with this roadmap, which was adapted from the World Heart Federation uh, roadmap on hypertension. And some of the factors they listed to mitigate this burden includes integrating hypertension, detection, treatment, and control within existing health services, especially the public primary health care services then promote a task sharing approach with adequately trained shoes. I'm coming back to this because this interests me a lot. And I believe this is one of the best buys any country in sub-Saharan Africa has to invest in. Then ensure availability of essential equipment and medicines for managing hypertension at all levels of care and provide universal access and coverage for detecting, treating and controlling hypertension. So coming back to the, to the issue of task sharing, that caught my attention when we developed um, uh, uh, this roadmap. Because of the uh, um, very few number of physicians um, to attend to the population, I think the best way to go about chronic diseases or uh, risk factors uh, for cardiovascular diseases is to, is to do a task sharing. We have to get the non-physicians trained as much as possible to be able to treat conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, if we really want to uh, reduce the burden or uh, the complications of, of these risk factors. And this caught my attention. And this actually was one of the things that made me um, to start thinking of how I could penetrate the primary health care you know, um, because before this time, much of my work has been at the tertiary hospital, trying to run registry, trying to run uh, some clinical trials. And that opportunity finally came, uh, that was in 2016, um, when there was a U, uh, U1 uh, call from the NIH. And uh, that call was on hypertension outcome translational research and it was for lower middle income countries. And then I had to reach out to Mark Hoffman, my friend. Um, before then, I met, I, I met Mark Hoffman two years before then, in 2014 in, in Harmit in Canada, when I, I went for the uh, World Heart Federation Emerging Leaders Program. Uh, Mark Hoffman happened to be the program director uh, for, 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 that, for that program. So I reached out to him and we did put in an, an application even though we are not successful, uh, NIH, I remember Dr. Brad Newsom, he was quite interested in our work and he encouraged us so much to put in for an, an RO1 grant. And good enough, um, we were successful in 2018, late 2018, we got um, uh, 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 an award 
this award was granted, application was granted to work on hypertension management in Nigeria. So it's actually um, a collaborative work. Apart from University of Abuja, Northwestern University collaborating, we have collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Health, the World Health Organization, the Nigerian office, and also Resort to Save Lives, which is a non-governmental organization. Uh, one of their main focus is to reduce high blood pressure in lower and middle income countries. And I know they are working in China, they are working in India, and also working in in Nigeria presently. And we we patterned, we, we made up the mind to pattern our, our work after the Kesa Permanente uh, North Carolina study. So our varo aim was to build a system for hypertension care and treatment that is centered on patients and non-physicians rather than on physicians. And this is the Kesa Permanente North uh, California story in which um, their, their program um, was uh, um, led to control from 44% to 90% in, in, in 30 years. And the components of that program was hypertension registry, clinic level performance fever, simple treatment algorithm, medical assistance visits for blood pressure management, and single pill combination. So when we set out our formative M1, was actually to develop an implementation pathways and intervention packages for system level large scale hypertension program that is adapted from the KPNC model, like I said before, in primary healthcare facilities in federal capital territory. And we decided to look at the primary healthcare, get to the grassroots, catch them um, early, treat them so that complications will be reduced as much as possible. And in addition also wanted to develop an additional patient level health coaching, including all blood pressure monitoring led by community workers in a sample of our facilities. And our, and, and our second aim was to evaluate the effectiveness of this system level large scale hypertension program, and also to evaluate the effectiveness of addition of a patient level coaching, including all blood pressure monitoring. Why our third aim was to evaluate implementation of this multi-level intervention through the REHAB uh, framework. So, and our hypothesis was that this intervention will reach the target population and will be adopted, implemented, maintained, acceptable and affordable at the system at both at patient level. So in, 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 in summary, the components of our uh, our intervention our program centers around creating awareness on hypertension in the community and among health workers, training of primary healthcare physicians and non physician health workers on management of hypertension. Because we thought that the primary healthcare physicians will give some support and supervision to the non physician. So we also wanted to involve them in this program, even though our program was going to revolve around non physicians and the patients. And also, non-physician health worker treatment and follow-up of patients and using our simplified treatment protocols. Uh, before this time, there was no simplified treatment protocol at the primary healthcare level in Nigeria. And also to encourage fixed dose and hypertensive combination, similar to the KPCN study. So in, in all, we wanted to develop a system for hypertension treatment because before this time, no system at all at the public primary healthcare level in Nigeria was treating hypertension. There is a system for vaccination, system for HIV care, system for tuberculosis care, and maybe system for infectious diseases like malaria, but there was none at all for, for chronic diseases like hypertension. And to set this stage, we carried out um, a pilot study in four uh, primary healthcare centers in the FCT. Um, uh, um, among 60 patients, whereby we showed that this is this shows feasibility of home blood pressure man monitoring for blood pressure control in Nigeria. Then we went ahead to select 60 primary healthcare centers in the Federal Capital Territory, and we selected this through a stratified random sampling method. Now there are 244 primary healthcare center distributed within the six local government council in the Federal Capital Territory. And some of the criteria we used was that the site must have at least two full-time staff. And we also gave priority to a site that have a liaison person 
or what we call a focal person that could that could link the different PHCs together within the same local government. And we also identified some sites that had some basic funding for, 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 for minor procedures like urinalysis and so on and so forth. Then we went ahead to develop an hypertension treatment protocol, which is the first of its type in Nigeria. And this was developed in collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Health, the WHO, Resort to Save Life, Nigerian Hypertension Society, Nigerian Primary Healthcare Development Agency, Community Health Workers, Pharmacies, Academia, and also Hypertension Advocacy Group. I will mention the Hypertension Advocacy Group, which we set up in 2016. And uh, the Hypertension Treatment Protocol was going to revolve around a long acting cash and channel blocker, amlodipine and an ARV uh, Lusatan. We decided to go for an ARV rather than AC inhibitors because of the side effects of cough and angioneuritima that is associated with uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Because we feel that one or such events in the community could discourage the people a lot. And eventually, if blood pressure is not controlled, then a tiazide could then be added. And why did we choose um, um, a cast, long acting carcinogen channel blocker? It came out um, because of our findings from the CRU study. The CRU study was um, a randomized control study which compared um, the, the efficacy of three combinations of, of um, uh, amlodipine and perindoprine versus amlodipine hydrochlorothiazide versus perindoprine hydrochlorothiazide. And it was carried out in 10 sites in six sub Saharan African countries, as you can see on the screen. And what we found out was that combination containing amlodipine were more effective than perindoprine plus hydrochlorothiazide in reducing both ambulatory systolic blood pressure and office blood pressure. Before this time, it is said that since the theory is that the, the hypertension of the blood patient is salt and water dependent. So your first line of treatment should be a tiazide. But this we proved from this that calcium channel blocker uh, containing combinations are more efficacious compared to combinations containing hydrochlorothiazide. So this informed the choice of the treatment, simplified treatment protocol revolving around amlodipine um, rather than hydrochlorothiazide. Then we went ahead to do what we call a SER assessment, service availability you know, assessment. And what we notice, and I want you to look at the last, the, the last uh, rules, um, focusing on equipment and supplies for hypertension, we notice that just seven sites out of the 50 that uh, responded to our questionnaire had guidelines. That is just about 13%, any form of guideline at all. Now, treatment algorithm, um, just three of them, and information, education, and communication, or IC material, just one of them, and functional blood pressure apparatus was much better, 55 of them. And so, didn't he will have a functional blood pressure apparatus at all? Then, in terms of information system, we found out that none of them use electronic patient records. Then, access to emails or internet was just in 8% of them. And what is also interesting um, um, in this is looking at availability of blood pressure medications. Even though some of the sites had uh, blood pressure medication, these were very, very few sites, like you can see. Uh, those having angiotensin converting enzyme, just 17%, angiotensin receptor blockers, 5%, beta blocker, calcium channel blockers was better in 32%. But none of them had a 30 day treatment regimen in stock you know, in their pharmacies. Then we then went ahead a part of our formative work to do some focus group discussions, apart from uh, some um, in-depth interviews that we had with, um, with uh, primary healthcare administrators. So we were able to have a focus group discussion for 10 females and five females. Amongst these were eight patients and, and seven non-physician health workers or community health workers. 11 of them had formal education for had no formal education. And already there is a manuscript preparation 
on the results of our findings. And um, I don't know, you can see this picture. Uh, this is at the Badridge. This was before, um, this was the first focus group discussion we had. So the team was just preparing to have that focus group discussion. And that is at the standing there, you know, addressing the team as we prepared. Then, secondly, we went ahead as part of um, our program to, to um, part of the program is to have a registry of uh, patients with high blood pressure coming in into the primary healthcare, this system primary healthcare. So we developed this, and this is an hypertension enrollment register. So every patient coming in with high blood pressure into the primary healthcare, they have their data collected. And those who are enrolled into the program have a potential treatment card where we uh, capture more details of their data. And in Kagini Primary Healthcare Center, this was the place we piloted um, um, our, our register and a potential treatment card. And I'm sure you can see um, uh, uh, Lisa is on there, uh, uh, Abby Patrick, and also Mark Hoofman with other members of the team and some of the staff of the primary health care center, Kagini primary health care center. Then community mobilization and awareness campaign, just like we said, is a great component of, of our program because we feel the people must be educated. Education is power. They have to be educated on what high blood pressure is and also to uh, disinform them about some myths, you know, about high blood pressure. So quarterly, the health promoters and health educators who work in these uh, six local government areas, they have six of them uh, working in these six local government areas, um, uh, embark on community awareness campaign. And in the first campaign, which was before the COVID era, around, um, uh, that around January, February, 61 participants were reached out to, and 570 questionnaires were administered. And there's a toolkit which the team developed which guides the, the health educators and health promoters. You can see some of these pictures. This was the pre-COVID era uh, um, during one of the mobilizations. And you can see during um, just uh, as the COVID was slowing down in Nigeria, they also embarked on another um, um, uh, mobilization campaign. And you can see uh, most of the people, the population were on mask there. And this is the IEC material, which the team also developed. Tips to avoid hypertension, eat all five good groups, and so on and so forth. And how to reduce the risk, reduce your salt, engage in regular physical activity. And before this time, like I told you, such IEC material were very, very rare in this primary healthcare center. But now, in the CC primary healthcare center we are working in, now these are quite available for patient information. And we also, uh, produce these masks, which are customized. You can see hypertension treatment in Nigeria. This was to hit the health promoters uh, when they uh, uh, continued their health promotion activity as COVID slowed down. So some, some of the things they did, apart from using PPEs like this and hand sanitizers, and that thing was that they had to reduce the number of people they were going to reach out to, to about 10 at a time, unlike before when they were able to reach out to up to 50 or 100 persons at a time. So looking at our results, we have been able to enroll about 4,000 patients. We started, our first enrollment was in December 2019, then uh, continued the February, March, and so on. And so in spite of the COVID, uh, um, a problem of COVID slowing down things, we have been able to enroll over 4,000 patients into this registry. And this is one of the area council, this is our budget council. So in each of the area councils, they will have different primary health care centers. And so this is 01 primary health care centers, 0 to 0 03 that you can see to 08. Some of the interesting thing was that um, re registration was actually picking up for most of the centers and had to slow down. And this was the peak of COVID in Nigeria. But fortunately, again, things seems to be picking up quite well. So let's look at some baseline demographics and clinical characteristics of over 3,000 um, of the recruited patients. About 57% of them had pre-existing 
um, uh, high, high blood pressure by the time they came in. Um, diabetes was in 6.4% of them. Smoking habits was quite low when you compare to the Western population, about 2.4% of them, while alcohol consumption was higher than smoking habit in 6.8. We normally take two blood pressure measurements for them, first and second blood pressure, and that is the average blood pressure, about 156, 151, systolic, and there are solid blood pressure there, 95. Uh, um, and, and 94 there. And treatment at baseline, about 55.3% of them want different types of treatment at baseline. And this pattern of antihypertensive prescription at baseline, calcium channel blockers were the most prescribed in 63%. And amongst the calcium channel blockers, amlodipine was predominantly prescribed. And your tensile receptor blockers, um, especially lucertan, um, it's also quite highly prescribed and adjutensive converting enzyme inhibitor, TASA, just in 3.7. There's a centrally acting medication we call alpha-methidopa. It's also quite, quite often prescribed in, in, in those PACs. And this tells us about the control of about those 3,800 3, patients. And control as over at baseline, which is zero, this is about 37, 40%. And it has been around that. Um, you know, um, one expected that maybe with time, you know, um, um, control was going to be well, going to be higher. But remember, that not all the patients uh, that came at baseline, you know, came up with a follow up. So it is very, very difficult to um, completely interpret the pattern of this. But what we know is that control is still quite, quite low, and it has overt from about twenty five to about thirty seven percent. Another strong component of our program is trainings and capacity development, especially for non-physician healthcare workers. And to date, we have had over 22 training and retraining sessions. That is over a one-year period because our program really started about June of last year. And of course, things then got slowed down with the COVID. Um, and among these people that have been trained, um, community health extension workers, community, health, um, community nurses, and record information uh, officer. And areas of training and retraining, I won't bore you with this, it goes from body of cardiovascular, the measurement of blood pressure, and so on, electronic data capturing of the hypertensive patients. So we are doing electronic data capturing now of all our patients. And when that, the data are collected electronically, they are sunk into the red cap in University of Abuja. So apart from that, we have done training on data collection, on dry blood sampling. I'm going to talk about our seroprevalence study and mention one or two slides on our results so far. And also training for qualitative data on antihypertensive supply chain mapping. We'll be quite interested in it because we have good supply of quality medications or antihypertensive medications. There is no way you can get the blood pressure of patients controlled. And so to date, we've trained over 120 community health workers and community health officers and 60 record information officers. And apart from that, there has also been a training on implementation research for team members that are, are interested. We had two face-to-face -face, um, uh, uh, training sessions um, when the Northwestern team visited uh, in June last year and November last year. And or monthly online training. So the first cohort for implementation research have, have, have completed um, their training. And we're looking forward to having a second cohort. Now, this, some of this shows us some of our training sessions. That is our IT person, Samuel Osage, um, putting um, uh, uh, information officers through on the red cap data. And this was one of our practical sessions with community health extension workers trying to teach them how to take blood pressure properly. And this is after one of the training also for community health workers and community health uh, uh, officers. I don't know, we can see Nami Kantula here. And these are some of our team members also here. And this was after our last face-to-face -face, uh, implementation research uh, by team members. You can see the Northwestern team also there. So it's been great you know, having to work with the Northwestern team, a lot of learning points. Advocacy, advocacy, advocacy is part of what um, we preach in our team because for us to have a good buy-in into hypertension treatment in Nigeria, we have to have 
good power of advocacy. So we have had several visits to stakeholders, the Federal Ministry of Health, World Health Organization of Nigeria, the FCT Primary Care Board, and so on and so forth. We have had meetings with different stakeholders, including directors of health in those uh, local government, head of pharmacies, because of buy-in. We have a widely representative advisory board and we have very close collaboration with Nigerian Hypertension Advocacy Group. This was our visit to the Federal Minister of Health. The woman here, Dr. Izigwe, is the is coordinator for non-communicable disease in, in, you know, in the ministry. You can see Mark Ufman there, myself, that is uh, Dr. Tony Oji, Gabriel Shedu, these are members of our team. And this was our visit to the uh, primary health care board. Dr. Iwat is actually the director of that board. And you can see the Northwestern team here from Lisa to Mark to Nami. Now this was after our first advisory board meeting. We have a very varied team from, from, um, from the physician, primary care physicians to, to uh, patient advocacy. This, is the, this actually is a vice chairman of the patient advocacy group. And so we have very people in, in our board. And this has actually helped our advocacy. And this is the hypertension advocacy group. Their vision is for every Nigeria to know their blood pressure number and take steps to get them normal, both now and in the future. And this was our inaugural meeting at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital. Professor Oja, Patricia Oja, is a professor of educational psychology at the University of Abuja, is the chairperson, and that is the uh, deputy chair for, uh, uh, of, for, for that Uwase, who is a retired agriculturists and those are members during our first inaugural meeting. So what this advocacy group does is that we give them um, some scientific and technical support. So they organize meetings, for example, professional bodies, they could invite us to come and speak, you know, to Agricultural Association of Nigeria or Psychologist Association of Nigeria or to organize some camps, you know, uh, meetings whereby people get their blood pressure. So their, their, their slogan is that you must know your number. There is no reason in this modern age why you must not know your number. So I will divert a bit. I mean, with the COVID era, uh, the team came up that um, it would be good to know the level of exposure you know, of our health workers uh, to COVID-19. Remember that it's estimated that up to 20% of people with SARS-CoV-2 are asymptomatic. And also, we know that health workers are at high risk for exposure. Currently, there are no data, as far as we know, um, in sub-Saharan Africa on incidents of anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, IgG serology. And this actually pushed us to do this, funded by West Northern University Catalyst Fund. And this was uh, our training session, just that members of the team, Gabriel, Shadow, and Tony, and this is our IT person again somewhere, because we captured data electronically and sunk it again into the red cap. And this is our re senior research nurse, uh, Regina Asuku, doing the dry blood sampling for an health worker in a primary health care. And this is Gabriel Shedu actually collecting data from the same uh, primary health care uh, uh, worker. So these are some of the pre preliminary results we have gotten um, uh, from interacting um, or taking um, uh, data information from these health workers. Um, we found out that uh, 61 of them, representing about 11.7%, have had prior testing, and over 88% have not had prior testing. And for those that who had prior testing, PCR good enough was in 98%, while um, serology was only in 1.6%. And, and, and the more common route of collecting sample was in NASA, um, a root uh, rather than the oral pharyngeal. And for those that had their sampling, uh, had their sampling, uh, um, about 83% of them were negative, 8.3 of them were positive. Uh, there were some awaiting, and there was one, someone that was not sure, he was not able to give a conclusive uh, information. So I mentioned this earlier, for us to actually be able to treat high blood pressure, we have, there has to be a lot of emphasis on quality medication, quality uh, uh, medications, which are affordable, which are accessible. Um, uh, so, hypertension control really needs reliable, affordable supplies 
of quality generate blood pressure. But in spite of this, uh, we found out that in Nigeria, most of the pharmacosurveillance and supply chain strengthening, uh, just like in most low and middle income countries, have been on infectious diseases rather than on non-communicable diseases. And this was shown in a recent investment made by the Nigerian government supply chain. This was actually focused on communicable diseases and vaccine and not on communicable diseases. So we then decided to evaluate blood pressure medicine stores at the 60 public primary health care centers and to investigate obstacles to supply chain mapping and to map blood pressure medicine supply chain in public, in public primary, secondary, and tertiary health center in the federal capital territory of Nigeria and also perform a market risk assessment of blood pressure lowering med medicines supplying the FCT. And this was led by two of our research pharmacists, Eugenia Ugunechi and Grace Shedu. And these are some of the preliminary results. Within three weeks, they worked so hard, they were able to have 10 in-depth interviews, seven focus group discussions, 17 of such were males and 10 were females. And the stakeholders in, in character with the hospital pharmacies, both in primary, secondary, and tertiary care, community pharmacy, practicing physicians, both primary care and cardiologists, hospital administrators, central store administrators, policymakers, regulatory bodies, hypertensive patients, uh, manufacturers and distributors of anti-hypertensive medications. And there are some points that went to saturation, and th this included high cost poor legislation, and the fact also that the porous border in Nigeria were encouraging falsified medications or substandard medications. Like I said before, training and training is a strong part of, 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 uh, of this program. And there's a implementation research training by the team. Uh, members of the team who, who have gone through the one-year implementation research at that face-to-face, two face-to-face -face sessions, and about 10 sessions monthly, uh, visually, um, 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 are now going to carry out some projects. I won't read this out, but there are implementation science researches. For example, this adoption and fidelity of non-physician healthcare worker to use phase dose combination, reach and effect of community, on hypertension and so on and so forth. Most of them centered around high blood pressure implementation research, uh, 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 except for one which is centering around diabetes. And we have allowed this because diabetes is also one of our things we are thinking about. As we know, diabetes and hypertension uh, commonly occur together. So apart from uh, our hypertension treatment in Nigeria program, we just uh, secured another grant, an NIH UG3, UH3 grant, to evaluate um, implementation and scale up of Nigerian sodium reduction program. And we have different stakeholders there from the government. NAVDAC is equivalent of the uh, um, uh, federal drug agents, just like you have uh, in the U, the FDA. So NAVDAC is Nigerian uh, agency for food drug and administration control. Uh, the Federal Ministry of Health Standard Organization of Nigeria, also NGOs, um, we also the WHO, and also the Judge Institute, apart from the Northwestern, and most, uh, most recently, University of Minnesota is coming in, and then Resolve to Save Life and Global Health Advocacy. And um, so, and that is sponsored by NIH and Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases. And why salt? Salt, I mean, we know that salt is linked to high blood pressure. Uh, There's the strong relationship with uh, blood pressure, then stroke and ischemic heart disease. And to date, estimates of average dietary salt intake in Nigeria range from seven to 10 grams per day, which far exceeds the WHO recommended uh, level of less than five grams. And we know that this uh, account for cardiovascular disease in up to 10% uh, of cases. Now, so Nigerians, um, good enough also, Nigerian uh, Non-Communicable Disease Action Plan came out in 2019. This is an action plan that will run from 2019 to 2025. And strong in that is included uh, um, that there, there must be a reduction of mean population dietary certainty by at least 20% by 2025. And they felt that this could be done by reducing salt intake through roof formulation of processed food products to contain less salt, set target levels for processed food 
and adopt standards for front of package labeling. And through legislation and through the food and drug agencies, um, they are at a feel that this could be enforced and this is quite achievable. So we are keen into this and our first aim to investigate feasibility, appropriateness, potential acceptability and adjunction and using this, uh, the CIFA uh, framework um, uh, to look at the contextual factors and facilities and barriers for implementation and scale up of this uh, Nigerian sodium reduction program. And secondly, want to measure initial implementation scale up and implementation outcome and cost of Nigerian sodium reduction program. And thirdly, to evaluate baseline, at baseline, that is at the UG3 state and temporary changes at the UH3 state in dietary sources of sodium, dietary sodium consumption and sodium in Nigerian food. And we have three teams um, uh, working together. We have a stakeholders interview team um, and, and, and the, 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 the role of this team is to engage different stakeholders from the federal government to the food industries, to the state government, to the local government, looking at factors you know, that will actually help in, 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 in implementing um, uh, a sort reduction program. We also have the population survey group, which will be working closely with the Federal Ministry of Health, who incidentally will be starting the WHO step survey in Nigeria. And what they will do, uh, uh, this group will do, is to uh, actually assess the knowledge of the population as regards source and also to, to, to do dietary record, assessing the consumption of salt. And in addition, there will be 24 hour urinary estimation in a subpopulation of about 1,200 1, of those patients. And this work actually will be uh, happening in three regions in Nigeria, the Federal Capital Territory, Ogun State, and Kaduna State. We are partnering with Resort to Save Life and Federal Ministry of Health who are actually interested in Ogun State and in also Kaduna State. And thirdly, there will be a food retail survey. There is an app and um, to um, uh, an app developed by the Judge Institute, whereby um, you, um, snapping the barcode and entering into a central uh, database, we could be able to estimate the sodium content of package or, or, or package food at this level. And later on, we'll be looking at sodium content of unpackaged food and street and also restaurant food. So in addition to our collaboration of the cardiovascular research unit or University of Abuja, we also have other international collaborations. Um, we have collaboration with King's College on our sensory and biological informative markers in the stratification of hypertension, trying to individualize the management of hypertension as much as possible. And um, uh, late last year, we published this paper on differences in hypertension phenotypes between Africans and Europeans, role of hypertension in journal of hypertension. We also have some collaboration with University of Cambridge, uh, looking at evidence-based uh, treatment of hypertensive heart failure in sub-Saharan Africa. And more recently, we have collaboration with um, New York University and, and St. Louis University, and also Family Health International, which is uh, um, um, involved in the management of uh, HIV with a lot of HIV clinics at the primary care level in South, South Nigeria. And we, have, we, we secured a, a, UG3, a UH3 grant also on managing hypertension among people living with, uh, with HIV and integrated more. And what we want to do is using a task sharing approach and what we call practice facilitators to train nurses on management of hypertension in, in, in people living with HIV. And more recently also, um, we are, this is pending. We put in a grant, an MRC grant, on novel strategies to achieve over 80% blood pressure control among hypertensives in Sub-Saharan Africa. That is the University of New South Wales in Sydney and King's College, and also with Northwestern University. So in conclusion, the burden of hypertension is enormous in Nigeria, with hypertension being the major driver for cardiovascular disease. There is the urgent need to reduce this burden, and this can be greatly achieved by developing a system for potential treatment that revolves around non-physicians and patients rather than the physician. 
There's also the need to leverage on already existing systems for the care of HIV and tuberculosis and health services for immunization, family planning, and maternal health. Um, uh, just permit me to really, really acknowledge the Northwestern team. My very good friend, Mark Hoffman, um, it's, been, it's been great working with them. Um, I don't think there's better people you can work with on, um, on research than this, than this team. And that is Professor Lisa Ishan uh, Abige. Uh, Tracy was with us before, but she has left. That is our research nurse, Regina. And of course, you can recognize these two people, I'm sure, Nandi Kandula and also Lisa Dege. And I have a very, very wonderful team over there in Nigeria, um, working tirelessly, you know, to make sure that everything goes on very, very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. work um, that you've been doing, some of which with us, but you know, a lot, a lot with others as well. Um, we had several <laughs> questions while you were talking, so maybe I'll, I'll kind of flip those over to you as we've got a little bit of time. So first question was really around uh, medicine quality, which you had alluded to a little bit. Um, one, the question was really about how much do you think substandard falsified medicines might be contributing to poor control rates? So that's the first question. Oh, thank you very much. Um, that's a very big question, um, a very good one. We, th we think that the problem of falsified medications is high. There is a work that was done by a colleague uh, as part of their World Heart Federation uh, project, uh, Sani Mahmood. And I if I remember very well, in about over 43% of cases, when they analyze some amlodipine to lysinopril, to, I think amlodipine and maybe lysinopril, they found out that the quality compared to what it should be was, um, was, was, was quite low, uh, you know, as low as 50% or 60% or what is. So I think this is big. And like we said, because patients pay out of pocket, uh, the borders are porous and also regulations are poor. So I think this is a big problem. But we need to have more objective data. We need to, and that is why we're interested in this, uh, in this mapping, so that we could take it uh, up, up forward to really describe this problem. I don't think we can really say the extent. The only thing we can say that it, is, it seems very from anecdotal data, it seems very big, but we have to do more to objectively say this is the burden of the problem, yeah. Thanks, TK. Yeah, I know Andrew Moran was on earlier uh, from Resolve to Save Lives. And, you know, it's a, this reliable supply of quality medicines is bedeviling every single hypertension program around the world mm. because it is so central to the intervention that we're trying to build all these implementation strategies to be able to get medicines. And so if that last piece doesn't work, I mean, it is such an Achilles heel. Um, so it's, yeah, ongoing uh, work for sure. Next question um, was trying to ask about um, steps to be taken to improve patient follow-up or retention. Um, certainly another tough one that we've been facing. Like, <laughs> yeah. Your thoughts on that? Great, great. I mean, that is great. We, we have um, developed some mechanism. Of course, follow-up is part of our program. We want to make sure that the patients are retained as much as possible. So what do we do? Um, we have a system whereby the information officers have to give them some reminders. Um, the good thing about Nigeria is that penetration of mobile phones um, is quite high. I think that is very good. So it's possible to reach out very well to these patients. So that is one way. The other way is to educate them um, as much as possible, uh, but some of the feedback we have gotten from the patients is that um, sometimes they don't have these medications. They don't have money to buy these medications. So coming back is a waste of time. Now we have a, we have a registry phase, which is expiring this month. And hopefully by next month, we are going to be intervening, um, going to get some medications to intervene. Uh, we feel very well from our form, when we did our formative work, that this will boost, you know, follow-up, patient coming back for the follow-up, yeah, getting this. So 
What we're trying to do again is to make the government buy into this. That is why we need a lot of advocacy, making sure that the patients who assess the community insurance, that is one way. The other way again, is to make them to be able to get these supplies and do what we call a revolving fund uh, mechanism. A revolving fund mechanism means that because the PACs we buy in bulk, patients, we just, they have access to them, availability in the first place, and because they are bought in bulk also, the markup normally also that the commercial or the, or the community pharmacies we have is not there. So these are some of the ways we are looking at. So after our intervention, which will be for about three to six months, what happens? We have to make sure that this system is maintained. And we are already having a lot of discussions with the pharmacists. The, 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 each, the, each of the local government has a, a pharmacist who heads pharmacy technicians. So we are looking at this of maintaining a chain and maintaining the chain, not just maintaining the chain and making sure that they have access to good yeah, quality medications. Yeah. Thanks, DK. Yeah, I mean, it's it's ultimately around prioritization of how limited healthcare resources are are, are spent. Treatment of hypertension is a highly cost-effective intervention among high-risk individuals, and so this emphasis that you've had on creating relationships to be able to in those that are aligned with national priorities, I think, has been really instructive um, for me to watch how skilled you are. At that, because ultimately, if there's not a large expansion of community insurance to be able to cover these, we'll never be able to scale up to a level that we know is going to meet the needs of the population. Okay, so uh, maybe one more question in the last minute. Uh, there's a what do you find is the most challenging aspect in getting the community to buy into preventive measures for diseases instead of, instead of waiting to simply take a pill? So a little bit bridging between kind of HD and, and Nigeria sodium study. Yeah, um, one of the problems is ignorance, uh, you know, lack of education and knowledge. Then the other problem, you have some competition, you know, um, in terms of herbal medicines and alternative medicines. That's another problem we have. So in our education, um, our toolkit that we developed, those issues are addressed. And there's also a lot of mis disbelief and some misbelief when it comes to chronic diseases. So, so which are some of the major, major problems? But I think one of the major thing is lack of education. So doing a lot of education awareness campaign that we are doing, we go a long way. And it's not just doing it one off, it's sustaining it. I think the problem we've had in this part of the world is that programs will come and die down. The, the, people, the people are not carried along. There is no buy-in into it. Uh, the community is just like dumping it on them. But what we're trying to do is to carry the community along as much as possible. And that's why the hypertension advocacy group, that is why we are working with these grassroots people. And good enough also, each of the primary healthcare center has what we call a village com health committee, you know. So these are some of the ways you can disseminate information to them. And we have also seen that at the community level, there's a lot of respect for community health workers and community health extension workers. Their words is just like a command. So empowering these people with knowledge, you know, training them is going to go a long way, you know, in, you know, in breaching this gap. Well, DK, I just want to thank you so much for an outstanding presentation and, and your willingness to spend time uh, to share your work. Um, thanks to the audience for, for joining and participating and submitting your questions. Uh, hopefully you can join us next month. Um, and you will be getting uh, a recording of the webinar. Uh, we'll be shared with you via email shortly. So with that, we will conclude today's session. DK, have a good evening. And, uh, thank you very we'll much. Catch up with you soon. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, November 6th. Okay. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.